So I think uh, welcome to our, I think it's number 10 of our seminar series on COVID-19. And we are happy to have two distinguished speakers in the seminar series today. They'll both be talking about the public health medicine measurement data aspects of the COVID-19 disease. Um, first of all, we'll be having John from Stanford. Uh, he is a professor of medicine at Stanford. He has done a number of studies in terms of the epidemics and the statistics and what is it that you can infer from data and what you cannot. So we are uh, thankful to him for uh, speaking in the seminar series. And then after that, we'll have Luca Foschini, who is a UCSB alum, will be joining us in the next half of the, of the talk today. And he is going to be talking about whether it is possible to distinguish between flu and COVID-19 based upon our personal health data. So Luca is no stranger to UCSB. He is our alum. So welcome to Luca and we look forward to his talk. Uh, without uh, taking much of your time, I would like to hand over the floor to John. And uh, as if you, based upon our protocol, we hold off on our questions till the very end. So, so with that done, I'll hand over the floor to John, who will get us started on this exciting journey in terms of trying to understanding of COVID-19. John, it's over to you. Thank you. Thank you for the very kind invitation. It's a great pleasure to join you today. Um, and uh, let me see if I can share my screen. Okay, so uh, what I'm planning to, to discuss uh, is uh, uh, trying to dissect some data on COVID-19 in terms of risks, prevalence, evidence, and decisions, because all of these are interrelated. Are these true statements about COVID-19? It is a very serious threat. It is very unpredictable. It is the pandemic of a century, similar to 1918 influenza. It is the top cause of death in 2020, outpacing all other causes. It is the infectious disease that has killed more people than any other in our generation. Here are the answers based on what we know so far. Indeed, it is a very serious threat. There's no doubt about it. Indeed, it is very unpredictable. We know very little still about its course and what will happen in the future. However, the person years lost with COVID-19 to date are about one thousandth compared to 1918 influenza. In terms of other causes of death, smoking will kill another nine million people this year, like every year, compared to, uh, of course, uh, close to half a million so far with COVID-19, but uh, people who are on average 80 years old and even within infectious diseases, tuberculosis has killed 1 billion people as a pandemic in the last two centuries. It still kills 1.5 million people every year. And the lockdown measures for COVID-19, if prolonged, might risk killing 1.4 million extra people, mostly young and middle-aged adults with tuberculosis in the next five years. Our original forecast for the impact of COVID-19 were pretty much doomsday predictions. The expectation for a new virus based on mathematical models was that up to 80% of the population will be infected. WHO came out in early March with a 3.4% case fatality rate and with a claim that their envoy found hardly any symptomatic patients. The infection fatality rate was dialed back to 1% or a bit more, but it was still very, very high compared to other viruses that we're dealing every year. The expectations for the total impact might have amounted to more than 50 million deaths with 2.2 million deaths in the US alone, according to the Imperial College. And this meant that our healthcare systems would be entirely overrun. So flattening the curve became the motto and extremely important to achieve. These are some quotes about the number of beds that would be required that were circulating in uh, mid-March in New York, 140,000 hospital beds and 40,000 uh, intensive care units and, and so forth in other states. What happened was that we lost lots of lives. However, these expectations did not materialize and that was good news in the middle of 
the bad news of all the loss of life that we encountered. For example, in New York, instead of 140,000 hospital beds, New York being the epicenter of the pandemic in the US, um, we went up to about 5,000 instead of 40,000, uh, sorry, instead of 140,000, went to about 20,000. Instead of 40,000 intensive care uh, unit beds, we eventually needed about 5,000. Uh, for Tennessee, the expectation was for 15,000 inpatient beds and 2,500 ICU beds and about 2,000 ventilators. The eventual numbers were 1,200 inpatient beds, 245 ICU beds and 208 ventilators. And for California, the expectations was that uh, we would have 1.2 million people who would need to be hospitalized and that we would require 50,000 additional hospital beds, but eventually COVID-19 patients occupied fewer than two in 10 ICU beds and 5% of general hospital beds. Modeling an unpredictable pandemic is not easy. These are four models by uh, amazing scientists. All of them did their best. They had the best tools. And here I'm showing you whether they were able to predict with their models what would happen next day. You know, not during the season, but within 24 hours. Could they get it right with less than 10% error for the number of deaths the next day? And as you see, uh, very rarely could they achieve that. Uh, most of the time, they were way off in terms of uh, the prediction. Even if you take uh, the coverage of the 95% confidence interval or the uncertainty in the prediction, uh, which typically was very wide in all of these models, only one out of the four models uh, seemed to have a pretty decent coverage of the uncertainty that ensued. Even for a, a waning epidemic wave like uh, the situation in the last uh, few weeks, uh, prediction has not been easy. Uh, there's huge divergence in models in terms of whether the epidemic will just be extinguished or will just linger or whether we will lessens because of reopening with the predictions uh, for uh, just what would happen in 10 days from now, ranging from incident death count of less than 100 up to 16,000 uh, deaths or more uh, within a week. Uh, currently, the way that things have evolved tend to be on the lower side of these uh, estimates. What we have seen is that epidemic waves of COVID-19 resemble Gombert's functions. Gombert's functions are sigmoids and they're different from exponential functions in that originally they're very close to them. So you see a very rapid rise but at some point you reach a plateau and then you see a decline. And we have seen that almost in every location where we have seen epidemic waves uh, explode, reach plateaus and decline. Of course, there are some areas like India and Mexico that are still in the early growth phase and uh, may be reaching close to the plateau. And we'll have to see if that holds true for them as well. But almost everywhere where we've had that experience of an epidemic wave come, it comes and goes mostly. Who are the people affected? This is looking at the age distribution of deaths in uh, 25 epicenters of the pandemic. These are the most hard hit locations around the world. Uh, there is a, a number of uh, countries, 13 countries and, and also 12 states in the US that were the most hard hit. And as you can see, about half or more, sometimes up to 75 or 80% of the deaths like uh, Belgium are in people 80 or above. There's a very large share in people 65 to 79, few deaths in age 40 to 64, and very, very few deaths below age 40, with the exception of India and Mexico that have much younger populations and where the age gradient is not as steep. If you compare the death risk in people who are above 65 versus those who are less than 65 in Canada, the risk gradient is a hundredfold different. There's a hundredfold difference in risk of death for someone uh, above versus below that uh, age threshold. In Switzerland, it is 80 fold. In Ireland, it's 76 fold. In Netherlands, 67 fold. Um, most European countries are between 30 and 100 fold difference. Most uh, US locations are between 20 and 50 fold difference. Again, India and Mexico, who have very young populations and very few elderly people. Uh, they're much less uh, steep in their age gradient with eight to nine fold uh, relative risks. 
these are similar data from the Open Safely database from the UK uh, with millions of people, people who have been matched against uh, deaths uh, in hospital from COVID-19. And you can see the very steep difference in risk according to age. Actually, if uh, you look at the gradient, if you compare children less than five years, less than um, 18 years old, and uh, uh, people over 80, their difference is about a thousand fold. We know now that uh, not only age, but some additional risk factors are making a big difference in terms of the risk of getting serious disease and also the risk of uh, mortality. Uh, so this is uh, looking at data again from the Open Safely Collaborative in the UK. You see the huge age gradient with practically no risk for children and for young adults and escalation of risk as you go to higher ages. A higher risk in, in men, uh, about twofold, and some other interesting uh, associations. Many people in the early days of the pandemic uh, thought that uh, we would not be able to protect specifically people with underlying and high risk because many people in the population have underlying conditions that might be comparing high risk. So the classic example was that uh, hypertension may be one such condition. But if you look at this plot, hypertension does not really increase the risk of severe outcome and death. Uh, its uh, point estimate is on the other side of one, if anything, and, and the confidence interval just uh, barely reaches up to one. Other common things like uh, diabetes uh, increase the risk, but we're not talking about uh, five or fold, five-fold risk. We're talking about modest increases. Things like asthma, the increase is extremely minor. So if you have an average risk in a young person or middle-aged person, uh, it may increase by 1.3 fold if you have uh, the need to use systemic steroids, but still the absolute risk would be extremely small. What does this mean is that if you look across the entire U.S. population in this pie chart, there's only about 9% of people who are at high risk. There is a very thin slice here, which is 0.5% of the population, which is nursing home residents. And nursing home residents account for 50% of the deaths. And then there's a few individuals with very severe diseases in the young age group, in the middle age group, and in the higher uh, age group that they have multiple conditions that cumulatively they may place them at high risk. If they just have one, that's unlikely to place them at, at a level that uh, would be meaningfully high risk. If you translate that to the share of deaths in the US, about 50 deaths are in nursing homes or related facilities. In some places in, in Europe, uh, some countries are, it's even higher. And then you have about 92% of deaths occurring in that 8% of people who are at very high risk. If somehow we could protect that 8%, of the population, we would avoid 92% of the deaths. How do we do that? Well, we have some measures that we know that they are effective and they have been shown to be effective even in randomized trials. For example, hand washing, respiratory etiquette, uh, avoiding mass gatherings, uh, uh, masks worn in proper settings. We know that these things work, but how about social distancing and even more so lockdown. First of all, what is it that we call lockdown? There's hundreds of measures that are included in the bundle of social distancing lockdown and their implementation has been totally arbitrary. If you compare notes across states and across countries, the mixture is pretty different. There's more than 1,300 ongoing or planned trials of COVID-19, but none of them is testing any of these social distancing measures. What do we even mean by social distancing and lockdown, and can we test these measures? Here's a question that we mean by these measures. They include physical distance, closures of spaces where people can meet, cancellation of events, travel restrictions, quarantine, other forms of uh, non-allowing uh, activities within lockdown, contact tracing and screening. Each one of them can be implemented in many, many different ways, affecting different aspects of activity, in different modes of implementation. For example, even for physical distance, Italy have a one meter rule. Australia has a 1.5 meter rule. 
we have a six foot rule like the UK. Some people say if you have someone who's forcefully coughing, it could reach up to six meters. Should we go for six meters? I'm not arguing we should, but I'm just showing you that the way that these measures are implemented can vary from one location to another. Um, how many people can get together in one place? Uh, Sweden was very different compared to others. There can be rules at 10 people, 50 people, 1,000 cancer, massive events and so forth. There's also issues about when exactly to implement these measures and when to de-implement these measures. We cannot stay in lockdown forever. I mean, it's okay to try to do something to contain the pandemic uh, when we are uncertain about its impact but we cannot really freeze our entire world forever. How do we sequence these measures? How do we combine these measures? How do we enforce adherence? How do we wean from them? How do we measure whether they have been adopted or not? You know, maybe we're just making investments in measures that have not really been adopted. How do we use response indicators and surrogates? Who are we targeting? Are we targeting the entire population? Are we targeting specific groups defined by age, occupation, workplace? perceived risk factors? Are we trying to change 100% of the population? Or are we trying to change that 8% of the population that is at high risk that can make a huge difference? And to do that, do we apply that in the whole world, in a whole country, in a whole town, in a facility? What kind of facilities are at high risk? Nursing homes and universities are like two extremes of, of risk. Of course, we cannot handle them in the same way. How do we precisely localize our measures? And also, what are we measuring in terms of success? Of course, we all want to save lives, but lives can be saved in many different ways. When are we going to measure our outcomes? Short term, longer term? Some of our measures have impacts that may have adverse consequences, not in the short term, but downstream with deaths of despair, for example, that may happen over months and years, or the consequences of unemployment and people losing their health insurance, or a health system being battered and losing its capacity, we may see the lives that are lost, not within a few days, but within weeks and months and years. How much long-term relevance are we trying to put in our decisions? How much effectiveness or risk-benefit ratios are we integrating? And eventually, how many different types of impact can we capture on education, on economy, on environment, on society, and health system at large? All of these are open questions. But at least we can start having some hard data that can guide us in terms of where do we go next and how can we change our decisions to make them more evidence-based. For example, one major theme during the pandemic is what multiple news sources have been hammering, that more and more young people are dying. Uh, why are young people dying? Hundreds of young Americans have been killed. And of course, if you look at a disease that probably has affected, my guess, more than 200 million people already, you will find some young people who have died. But in the big picture, this is extremely, extremely rare. This is a disease that does not kill young people. We do have evidence for some increased risk of Kawasaki syndrome, but really, as I said, the risk gradient of young people versus those who are over 80 years old uh, is like a hundredfold, and if you compare children against over 80, it's a thousandfold. Visualize the risk for people who are less than 65 and who represent uh, anywhere between 80 to 90% uh, of the population in, in different countries. We can try to translate the risk into the equivalent of death risk from traveling by motor vehicle. And this is what I have done for you here looking at the worst hit locations around the world and the worst hit uh, states uh, in the US uh, as compared to the risk of dying during average commute in the US, which is about 32 miles per day. About half of these locations have a lower daily risk during the time that we have fatalities from COVID-19. Some of them have higher. For example, the highest is in New Jersey and New York, where during these two months of high fatalities, the risk of dying from COVID-19 was equivalent to driving from, uh, let's say, Manhattan to uh, Washington, D.C. There's truck drivers who do that for a living every day their entire life. So it's, it's a risk, no doubt. But if you look at it at a population level, it is a risk that could be manageable. And actually, these numbers pertain to risks at the peak of the 
epidemic fatalities or close to that. So if you look at the entire season, it is much less than that. Less than 65 years old without underlying diseases uh, comprise a very thin section, a very thin proportion of the total deaths uh, with COVID-19. Uh, New York City data show that only 0.6% of all deaths are in that age stratum without underlying diseases. Uh, Georgia is 1.4%. Sweden seems a bit higher at 2.2%, but actually these data include uh, uh, lots of people who have comorbidities. Uh, the exclusions pertain only to four comorbidities. So if we could exclude other uh, severe diseases, the risk would still be very, very low. Overall, anywhere between 0.6 and 2% of all COVID-19 deaths are in people who are less than 65 and have no underlying reasons to die other than COVID-19. How widely spread is the infection and how lethal is this virus? This is, a, I think, the two most tantalizing questions that we've had since the beginning of the pandemic. And I think that we have the means to answer them a bit more reliably now. We have 23 seroprevalence studies that have been presented in complete papers uh, and they have been done around the world and they have checked seroprevalence uh, uh, for IgG or IgM, rarely IgA antibodies. The rates of seroprevalence range from very low up to 47% in one seroprevalence study in Brooklyn, uh, New York. And if you translate these numbers to infection fatality rate, you get a median of 0.25. If you translate them to infection fatality rate in people who are less than 70 years old, you get uh, an infection fatality rate median of about 0.04%. What we learned from these studies is that the infection fatality rate can vary a lot. In some locations like Japan, it is one-fifth of influenza. In some other locations like Queens, it is 10 times or more than that of influenza. Infection fatality rate is not a constant. It's not the gravitational constant or the KM of an enzyme in a Michaelis uh, uh, function. It depends on the case mix, it depends on the population structure, it depends on who's infected, it depends on how people are treated and many other factors. For example, if we let nursing homes get infected, this can be devastating. We can have a very high infection fatality rate because 25% of infected nursing home residents in some studies that have been done will die. Conversely, if we have children or if we have students at a university, it is possible that no one will die out of thousands and thousands of, of children and uh, students being infected. The good news is that since we know many of these factors now, we can make the infection fatality rate much lower by preventing the infection to attack those who are likely to be devastated if they're infected. Another common misconception is how many people need to be infected. Mathematical models initially said that 60% or perhaps 80% had to be infected to reach herd immunity. However, these codes assume homogeneity of mixing of populations, which is something that never happens and rarely gets even approximated. It may happen in Bergamo, where we had a soccer match, half of the city's population was embracing and kissing each other during the whole evening and night. It may happen in some locations of a very densely populated city with a, a transit system like New York. It is unlikely to happen in 99% of places around the world. This means that the epidemic may end in some most, most places with far lower percentages of people being infected. Will a second wave come? We don't know. They're possible, these second waves, but we just don't know when, if, and how they may happen. We just need to be prepared for them and be prepared to protect people and settings who are most at the need to be protected. There's some interesting data that have been evolving that even in the current circumstances, we may not need to reach very high levels of infection in the global population. For example, there's a study that shows 50% of unexposed population already has CD4 cellular immune responses to SARS-CoV-2, suggesting potential cross immunity from garden variety coronaviruses. This may also explain why the epidemic waves stop with low percentages of people being infected. I mentioned nursing homes. Another place that we need to be very serious is hospitals. A lot of infections in China and in Italy and New York and probably other places were nosocomial infections. This infection is often asymptomatic. 
So our prevalence studies show that in Lombardy, between four to 43 percent of healthcare workers with highest rates in places that were hardly hit, were hard hit, were seropositive. They had been infected with the virus. 15% in Barcelona, even in Utah, where probably the seroprevalence in the general population is very low. When you look at emergency medicine uh, staff, they have uh, seropositivity at 5 to 7%. And of course, this is a population that we can test and that we can provide coverage and protection both for them and for the patients that they may be encountering. Asymptomatic infection seems to be a driver in the equation of COVID-19 that we have neglected. We know more and more now that most people who are infected either have no symptoms or have very mild symptoms that they do not recognize and they do not go to get tested. This is a modeling effort that I've done with uh, Ellen uh, Kuhl and her team at Stanford of an SCIS IAR model where we try to model the impact of asymptomatic infection. And I think that this is really the big piece in the puzzle that we missed in the early days and we left so many high-risk locations completely unprotected, for example, nursing homes. Should we expect a treatment for COVID-19? Maybe yes, maybe no. So far we have one trial that has shown some very promising results for dexamethasone and another trial with uh, less so, not clear survival benefit, but potentially so for another antiviral agent. We have a huge number of trials. They started very quickly within a few days of the launch of the epidemic, uh, and we have more than 1,300 trials that are planned or are started. But unfortunately, only 28 trials have been completed today, and a survey that we have been doing suggests that most of them are having problems recruiting. My guess is that 80% or more will be abandoned because they will just have no patience to recruit unless there is a second wave, and of course, I do not wish that there would be a second wave. Dexamethasone uh, has the most promise today. Uh, actually, uh, yesterday evening, I saw that there was a preprint that was released, and the data suggests that if you look at the full paper that is a preprint now, a decrease from a death risk of 24.6% down to 21.6%. Uh, so about 3% uh, or uh, one out of seven, uh, roughly, or one out of eight uh, reduction in the risk. It is something but it is not really a panacea. So where do we go from here? We know that there's many things that we can do that would work against COVID-19, and most of them are not really disruptive at all. Number one, intense testing. In particular, intense early testing combined with contact tracing in the early phase before the epidemic wave establishes itself. And I would say you can do that also for a second wave. Singapore and Taiwan were the best success stories. Singapore documented 42,000 infections with only 26 deaths. That's an infection fatality rate of 0.06%, which is less than influenza. I think this is something that we need to do again to pick any resurgence of a second wave. And I think that we also need to perform rigorous epidemiological surveillance with representative samples of the population to see where we are. Because if we just wait for people to come with severe disease, ready to die, ready to be admitted to the ICU, this is typically two or three weeks after the resurgence of the wave. I think we need to employ the information that we have gathered on the risk inequalities of COVID-19. We need to protect hospitals and nursing homes with draconian hygiene and infection control measures. We need to test all personnel and residents regularly, more frequently in periods of recrudescence uh, or suspected activity of the epidemic. Eventually, I think we need to protect with draconian measures about 5 to 10% of the population. 95%, 90 to 95% probably can have very good outcomes just by using standard measures that are known to work for the general population. You know, hand washing, respiratory etiquette, mask where appropriate, some non-disruptive distancing would be sufficient. We need to protect predominantly the high-risk settings, and of course, it's not just hospitals and nursing homes, there's meat processing plants, there's prisons, there's homeless shelters, there's boats and so forth. Eventually, as we realize COVID-19 is a disease of inequality, wealthy, healthy people like me are sheltering in place, while lots of people with low wages who are considered essential workers all this time they have been working and they have been hammered by the virus with very little protection. COVID-19 is a disease that creates even more inequality. 
So we need to protect the disadvantaged. We need to focus our social attention to protecting those at need, to protecting those who are, are not uh, like many of us, uh, advantaged and very well protected anyhow. Eventually, if we do that, I think we can achieve very good outcomes for the entire population without having to resort again to very draconian total lockdown measures that may have tremendous negative consequences and they may destroy our entire world. So I would say, don't destroy the whole world with aggressive measures, please. Many thanks to a number of uh, colleagues who I have worked with uh, these days on COVID-19. This is just a very small list among hundreds of people who are my benefactors and I, I believe that I have learned a lot interacting with them. Thank you for giving me this opportunity and uh, I look forward to questions from the audience. Thank you, John. And now it's over to Luca. Thank you, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Thank you for releasing. You should be seeing my screen right now. Okay. And there we go. <clears throat> Just another quick check. Can you see my slides? Great. Okay, thank you everyone. Uh, my name is Luca Foschini. I'm the co-founder and chief data scientist of Avidation Health. Uh, I am a gaucho. I graduated from UCSB in 2012 with a PhD in computer science. Today I'm going to talk about how to measure COVID-19 and influenza in real world settings via person-generated health data. So uh, first of all, uh, a little bit of a shameless advertisement. Avidation is a company, is a local company. Uh, our mission is to enable everyone to participate in research and health programs. We started here in Santa Barbara uh, around eight years ago. Now we have three offices and 200 employees. We really work on um, you know, making research um, available to everyone uh, and, and our partners are hospital, clinics, university, uh, biopharma and uh, academic organization. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that in a second. Um, one common theme of all research studies that we run or power is the use of person-generated health data as part of, of those. Um, Person-generated health data, PGHD, initially called patient-generated health data, uh, has been defined as any data point that is generated by a patient or their caregiver. Um, it is true, however, that the data that we are be talking about today and you see here in these slides uh, is much more than uh, characterizing patients only. It also characterizes healthy people before they become patients. Uh, this kind of data can look like anything uh, uh, from the most futuristic things you see in the slides, smart clothing, wristbands, smart shoes, smart homes, smart toilets, uh, to the much more um, common and uh, often overlooked voice of the patient, of the participant, of the member, of the individual um, through, for example, surveys or questionnaires. When you have this data, when you have continuously collected permission uh, by the participants that, that are part of the study uh, data, then you can start understanding health and disease on an individual level and on a continuous basis. So you can see you know, changes over time and you can you know, try to detect onsets of, of infections like we are doing with a, a study with a, with, a, with a grant that was just awarded by Barda and Gates and Melinda um, uh, Foundation. Um, or you can use it to understand if uh, people with glioblastoma, which is a cancer of the brain, are going to recur. Uh, or you can use it to understand cognitive impairment by looking at patterns of usage of smartphone and other um, electronic appliances that are uh, essentially a window on our cognition. Or you can use it to understand um, whether a, um, uh, 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 your Apple Watch and, and uh, arrhythmia detection system that's there plus other 
apps that are related to your cardiovascular health are actually going to uh, improve health outcomes. And this is one uh, of the recent study we've been uh, running in collaboration with Johnson & Johnson and Apple. Um, this is just an example of what TGSD can help you do. Um, for more information, you can look at evolution.com slash research. And uh, um, one uh, other piece of context that I'm going to give you before we jump into the COVID specific uh, topic of today is what, uh, what, where do you, where do you find this population? Where do you enroll uh, people for studies that use patient generated health data, which can be done virtually, which can be done in a distributed way. Uh, and uh, for us, uh, it's been really important to leverage uh, Achievement, which is a health program that we power at Abidation. It's a it's, a, it's an app uh, in the most concrete sense. It's something that you can download from the App Store. Uh, anyone can do that uh, or uh, Play Store. It's being used by around 4 million people in the United States, which makes it the largest virtual research site in the US. And it looks like uh, the screenshots you see here. Uh, you can, uh, as, a, as a member of this platform, you are rewarded to perform health activities. And some of these activities are actually joining research studies. Uh, like the one I'll be talking about today on COVID. So switching gears a little bit, I want to um, give you an overview of initial of an initial readout uh, um, submitted as preprint uh, a couple of weeks ago, and now under pre-review submission. Uh, the goal of the study was to try to quantify prevalence and progression over time of symptoms of COVID-19 as compared to other ILIs, uh, influenza-like illness, and in the specific case, influenza, so the, the common flu. Um, and also um, use data from commercial wearable devices to understand if it is true what we read on the news every day that your Apple Watch can tell you when you're gonna get infected with COVID or, if, or your Fitbit or your Garmin, on, depending on who writes the news. The data I'll be describing comes from a, um, a very large participatory influenza-like illness. Again, ILI, it's an acronym that you'll see a lot during this talk, study that we've been running on the Achievement platform for three years. Um, we've done that, we do that every year at influenza season, uh, and we've quickly pivoted that effort to also inquiry about COVID-related symptoms uh, this year at the end of March as, as the pandemic was, um, um, was taking hold in the United States. What it looks like from a participant experience is what you see here in the screenshots. If you're a user of Achievement, um, uh, once a week you're presented with this offer um, uh, to, um, to, to answer questions about symptoms uh, of flu-like symptoms that you might have experienced over the last week. Uh, if you say, yes, I did experience flu-like symptoms, um, then you are taken to a survey, and in the service you give more information about I don't know, what kind of symptoms, what, what day was the worst, uh, did you talk to a um, clinician about that, did you seek care, what kind of care did you seek, what were the risk factors you were exposed to, uh, and you're also communicated, you're also given a, a very good and deep overview of what your data is going to be used for, uh, and uh, you also require permission to access other data you might have sh uh, shared with the achievement platform, specifically data from your wearable devices for people that have one. Uh, and uh, and that, that, that's one of the, the things we're going to show you later. So in this analysis, we will consider um, data coming from uh, around 60,000 uh, ILI once again, influenza-like illness events that were recorded through this participatory flu surveillance program over the last year, of which around 7,600 actually had reported a confirmed diagnosis. So that means that in that follow-on questionnaire that I was showing you earlier, the participant says, yes, my flu was actually confirmed clinically, or yes, my COVID was actually confirmed clinically with the following test. Um, and um, among those 7,000, uh, we consider three different cohorts. One of confirmed COVID-19 cases of 230 patients, one of 426 flu-confirmed cases 
during the time of COVID. This is, goes from the end of March when we updated the questionnaire to the end of uh, April uh, when uh, we, we had the preliminary data pool that I'm describing today. Uh, and so this is a way to compare flu and COVID face to face at the same time in, in order not to have confounders that come from uh, you know, the lockdown measures, for example. And then we have a third cohort that is much larger, that is about people that had a confirmed flu event before the pandemic started. So from beginning of December 2018 to end of March 2020. And we're going to look at two particular types of PGSD, of person-generated health data. One is those questionnaires that I showed you. Uh, so person-reported data is called, uh, in which you know people tell you about their symptoms and what day was the worst and what are this self-care. Uh, and then the second piece of data we're going to look at are uh, data uh, passively collected from commercial wearable devices consented as part of the study, as I was saying earlier, and specifically sleep patterns, resting heart rate, and total step counts. Now, uh, it is important to understand that the population I'm showing to you from which the three cohorts uh, uh, belong to is not representative of the United States. This is a convenience sample, uh, it's called in, in clinical uh, terms, which means that we didn't optimize to have a representative sample. The sample skews white, young, and female. Uh, and uh, therefore, comparison between the cohort I showed you are, um, are okay to do because the cohorts are not uh, substantially different from each other, uh, the people that got the flu and the, got the COVID, uh, but any findings of, on the population itself should not be generalized outside the population uh, unless you're able to reweight, and we're going to talk about that a little bit at the end. Uh, just a quick flyby to the amount of data preparation that goes into uh, processing PGHD uh, person generated health data in order to find valid uh, conclusions. Um, so this pipeline here shows what um, surveys processing looks like. Uh, and what there are, uh, when you design a survey, there are a lot of things you can put into the survey to make sure that you know people don't contradict themselves, or you you know catch duplicates, or you catch implausible uh, events. And so um, that those are all used uh, in post processing to make sure you have the highest quality possible survey data. And for the wearable device data, similarly, uh, there is a, a little less chances of. Um, uh, intentional uh, misrepresentation because these devices are worn passively, but uh, there's still a lot of data preparation that needs to be done in order to analyze changes around, for instance, a flu event. Uh, because, for example, in order to understand changes, you need to understand what the baseline of a, of a patient is. And that means that you need to have seen that device, that sensor being worn for a given amount of time with a given amount of frequency, which is what we call data density uh, constraints that we enforce in the data. Um, so uh, there's a lot to be talked about here. Uh, it's kind of boring stuff. Data preparation is never fun, uh, but it's a fundamental piece of what makes uh, your analysis valid. So all the details can be found in the paper in the Meta Archive preprint. Um, starting uh, looking at the results here um, at a very cross-sessional level, so comparing uh, cohorts um, of patients, not over time yet. Uh, we're seeing what we've been seeing from many other reports, anecdotal and uh, in-hospital reports. Here we confirm outside the hospital, so before people get in the hospital, remember these are people in real world using an app, they're not sick enough to be uh, taken to the hospital yet. We see the cough, is more prevalent in COVID as compared to uh, the flu at the same time of COVID, uh, but not that much. Um, very prevalent in general, but not very uh, specific, so not discriminating between the two. Uh, loss of sense of smell uh, called anosmia is actually quite discriminative. In fact, it happens in 40% of the COVID patient and only 15% of the flu patients. However, as you see, it's not very sensitive, like not, not everyone with COVID has anosmia, uh, at least in our population, you see that less than half of the people do have it. Um, and um, shortness of breath seems to be really one of the one that's quite uh, sensitive and specific. You have 65% of uh, COVID patients reporting that versus 25% uh, only of, of flu patients. Again, this is um, 
this is no no news and this kind of cross-section analysis we've seen a, a lot of those um it's one of the few that is around people that are not yet at the hospital yet but again uh, no incredible new findings here uh, what i think is more interesting are data of the time course of the symptoms so how symptoms evolve over time and this is possible to look at because we uh, we have this ability of having this continuous connection with the uh, patient that are part of the study. So in general, we see that COVID lasts significantly longer than flu. Um, the median uh, time of the time course of disease for COVID is 12 days as compared to nine or seven of the two flu periods that we have as control. Um, and, uh, and I think it's really telling to look at the specific symptoms uh, time course. So here in this panel, you see for all the symptoms, we, we ask a questions, uh, I mean, we ask in the questionnaire, um, in the y-axis, you see the percentage of that cohort reporting that symptom for every day after onset. So the zero day in the x-axis is the onset, the, the day the, the patient reported the onset, and then each day after that, uh, we report the percentage of cohort that's reporting that given symptom. So you see that COVID is still here as compared to dark uh, green of the flu during COVID, and you see a gray line to, um, to uh, for a silhouette for the flu before COVID. Uh, you see that, for instance, fatigue or, or cough they're pretty, it's pretty prevalent in both flu and COVID, but it lasts a lot longer for COVID. You see that excessive teal color on day, you know, from 14 to 28, which is actually very uh, in line with anecdotal reports that we see, for example, on Twitter, of people that say, you know, that the people that do get fatigued, they get this lingering fatigue that lasts forever. Um, and um, we can see, again, the shortness of breath and anosmia are really... Um, acquired specific symptoms. Uh, you see that you know all, pretty much only COVID patients have that, uh, and uh, so it is for chest and pain pressure uh, as well. Now to the second kind of data um, we've been looking at. This is data from commercial wearable devices. Specifically, this one is for Fitbit. However, we have uh, other data that we haven't yet analyzed in this preliminary readout here. Um, here we are uh, plotting the percentage of each cohort at day 0, 1, 2 as um, reference to 0 being the day of symptom onset. We're plotting the percentage of the cohort reporting, sorry, um, showing uh, anomalous resting heart rate. Um, there's a lot to unpack here. So what is resting heart rate first? It, uh, it's that little number that you get from your Fitbit or your Apple Watch. It tells you the number of beats per minute of your heart rate when you are at rest. It's usually measured during sleep. Um, and, um, and if you have connected your Fitbit to this study, we're able to get resting heart rate for the participants. Uh, not many, around 40 of them only had enough data quality to be able to do an analysis, but uh, it is enough to, to see some signal here. So that resting heart rate, um, we, um, we um, analyze and we define at the individual level what anomalous look like as whether it is 0.5 or 1%. Uh, or, or zero, depending on different thresholds that you see here, uh, plotted with different shades of red, standard deviation above the individual mean. So individual mean taken outside the ILI event, that's a baseline for a person. If within the ILI event, the resting rate is, um, um, you know, one standard deviation above their own mean, we call it anomalous and in this plot we plot the percentage of the cohort that has anomalous values in that day. As you see, uh, for the 0.5 standard deviation threshold, so means like mildly severe, severe anomaly here, um, we have that 40% uh, of, the, of the cohorts from day zero to day four or five uh, do show uh, and, and anomalous resting heart rate uh, for COVID. Uh, we do see though the same for flu, uh, uh, for two kinds of flu, the flu during COVID and the flu before COVID. Um, you can see that for COVID itself, if you really squint and you want to read extra patterns on the data, 
Um, you also have a big bump from one standard deviation level of anomaly, which is you know, a more severe one that you don't see for the rest of flu. But in general, you don't see a lot of specificity in this kind of signal. And especially you don't see any of those bumps happening before symptom onset. So one of the things you read a lot in the news these days is that can your wearable device forecast symptom onset? So like tell you before that happened and at least for resting a rate alone at the daily level for the kind of um, device that we looked at, which once again is a Fitbit, we don't see a lot of possibility for forecast here, but we do see a possibility, you know, signal that happens at day zero of, of the symptom onset, which is, you know, still 10 plus days before people are going to get hospitalized if they go on to that uh, fate. Um, another interesting, very preliminary finding that this needs to be confirmed with a larger data set uh, here, and there's a lot of methodology that needs to be talked about that I would refer you to the paper. Um, but what it looks like is that if you, if you take step counts now, so go back to our Fitbit, measure resting heart rate, we also measure step counts. Uh, in fact, it was you know invented and commercialized for that reason initially. Uh, if you look at the step counts that are lost during the uh, flu event or the COVID event, um, you see that for flu, those that loss goes back to baseline. People do tend to go back to walking as as their normal self. Uh, but for COVID, at least in the up, up until day 20, which is the most we could see uh, uh, in, in this preliminary readout, that doesn't happen. It seems like that the return to baseline is much um, is much uh, slower. And uh, um, there's a lot of methodology discussion that goes into what baseline looks like. What what um, this models here is measuring the difference of what it is observed during the ILI, ILI, ILI event as compared to what is expected for a person to be walking on a certain day. And that takes into account the other week effect, seasonality, and previous history of the person, as well as uh, uh, similar people uh, around the, the, the uh, sim people similar to, to the one uh, measured. Um, so for, for detail of how that counterfactual prediction of what would the step counts look like in a day of flu had the person not had the flu, which we are comparing to and we need to compute in order to do these plots, please refer to the papers and that'd be really interesting to uh, you know, hear your thoughts about the methodology. Um, one last uh, piece of results. Um, we have also looked at care seeking behavior. This is purely from the survey, so from the uh, participant reported outcomes um, um, compared to non-COVID, uh, flu and pre-COVID flu, uh, COVID-19 pa patients are much more likely to seek care in emergency room, uh, which is unfortunate, as uh, uh, John was saying earlier, because it means that you, you're, you're exposing folks at the emergency room with a virus, potentially. Um, Oh, we see that uh, COVID-19 people are also more likely to seek care via telehealth services, um, which is not unexpected given the fact that, you know, that, that up until uh, a few weeks ago, uh, mobility was uh, substantially restricted. And finally, um, not surprisingly, COVID-19 people are much more likely to end up hospitalized as compared to flu people, um, more than twice as much or three times as much, depending on which control flu, uh, um, flu cohort you use. Okay, finally, um, talking about um, I would think I showed you, of course, has bias and limitation um, um, that, that needs to be uh, reminded. Um, I, once again, this is a convenience sample, so it's not representative of the US population. Comparison across cohort makes sense because those cohorts are not too different from each other, uh, but anything else that wants to generalize this outside the population should be, uh, should be, should be reweighted re and, and, and not uh, immediately generalized. Um, there is a com potential confounder that comes from a uh, self-reported diagnosis. Again, we don't have the ground truth clinical notes that tell us that these people have been diagnosed, but we ask them what test they took. Uh, and, uh, you know, there might be a misunderstanding on the testing results. There might be, you know, intentional uh, miscommunication. So uh, that, that is one thing to take into consideration. Um, uh, up until recently, COVID-19 patients um, testing was 
uh, was scarce. And so only people with more severe symptoms were tested. So there might be a bias that comes from that as well. Uh, and there also might be a bias that comes from the fact that patient reported outcomes and wearable device data are usually more likely to be worn where symptoms, when symptoms are not that bad. When you feel really, you know, really poorly, uh, you, you, you don't want to answer a question or you don't want to wear your Fitbit. So there might be a bias on, on that sense that might not, might conceal us actually the most severe cases. Um, what does this data is helpful for? Um, my opinion is it is a nice complement to all the data that comes from a clinical setting in generally termed as real world data, but it's not really real world data because it starts when the person gets to the hospital. I would actually posit that what I'm showing right now is the real world data before uh, uh, someone goes to the hospital. So uh, what this data can inform study design, as John was talking about, to develop intervention for COVID studies because it, it tells you what, what what symptoms look like, what is the time course, what is it you can expect someone that becomes uh, C-positives um, and yours, therefore uh, make you understand how you can uh, organize logistically your uh, study, or you can usually also use uh, this data in terms of uh, risk factor to raise pretest probability for additional tests. Um, when N is large enough, not the N I showed you here, this data can also be used for hotspot detection. Again, this really gives you the pulse of what's going on right now as compared to what's going on in the hospital, which is you know, a much more delayed uh, uh, data point. Uh, and uh, I think it's also a good use case to explore how to share these patient-generated patient health data, uh, data sets more widely. There has been a big effort in sharing uh, claims in electronic medical record as part of COVID related efforts and we kind of understand there uh, what the identification and privacy preserving way of working collaboratively in this data looks like. We don't understand that so well for the kind of data I've showed you today, time series and, and, and survey. So there is here an opportunity to, uh, to use this data as a use case to understand how the community can work on it. Um, finally, uh, next steps, um, more data is still coming in, in this specific study. So at the end of study is the end of August, uh, and this data will be shared uh, together with other biometric data in COVID in a platform called Synapsis, uh, which is hosted by Sage by Network. Um, there are definitely a lot more analysis to be done in this very data here. I just touched upon Fitbit and we just unpacked only half of the survey. Uh, so there's, there's a lot more to be looked at on this specific readout as well. And then there are new efforts that we are spearheading at Evidation and other companies on collected new data. Uh, I briefly mentioned two of, um, sorry, three of the additional one we're working on. Pulse is a 200,000 plus person uh, study about uh, people health attitudes during pandemic. You know, pandemic has changed health in many ways, not only virus related, uh, but uh, as John was saying, also everything else has changed. Like you, you don't see the, your doctor anymore. So diagnosis are, uh, are, are uh, delayed and, and you know, other um, uh, things like that might happen. And Pulse is uh, investigating ex exactly that particular cases. And then we have a symptom detection project with Barda, as I was talking about earlier, and uh, uh, daily symptom tracking uh, for mental health reasons in collaboration with uh, New York Central Mental Hygiene and Mount Sinai. Um, other than that, material that I presented today is available at the links here, the Med Archive paper. There is also a tutorial in my uh, tweet account that simplifies uh, things and uh, in, in, in makes it more digestible. And with that, I conclude and thanks all my collaborators uh, and uh, my funders. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, we have time for, I would like to ask a question, quick question each to both the presenters today. Uh, Luca, the question to you comes from Sumaya. Uh, questions about how do you account for the uncertainty in the crowdsourced data? Uh, do you cross validate it in, in some manner? That's the first part. The second part is what is the reason for the much lower response rate after March when COVID hit the, so those are the 
questions for you to answer. Yeah, very, very quickly, as it, the, the answer could become very technical and long, but how do you account for uncertainty in crowdsourced data? Well, part of that just remains endemic, as I was saying, but part of that is controlled by the fact that there is a trusted relationship with the achievement members. Uh, they are very engaged with the research and the platform uh, and, and therefore are more likely to contribute data that we uh, understand as, as meaningful. Uh, there is a big data preparation process, like the way you design the study and the survey that is uh, geared towards uh, filtering out law plausibility and law quality data as I showed uh, earlier uh, in the slides. And then uh, let's remember that this is patient generated health data. You always have the opportunity to recontact the participants, at least in our case. So if there's actually something very much of interest that you want to confirm, there is the opportunity to do so. Um, the lower response rate after March, um, it, is, um, it is only apparent. Uh, it depends on the fact that the flu prevalence really drops uh, after February. Uh, and, and so there's, there's little flu left uh, after the end of March. And COVID cases are not as many as John was showing, like in terms of total incidence, it, it, it's quite low. So that explains how, what, why we see so little uh, as compared to before March flu. Thank you, Luca. Uh, John, a question for you. I'm sure you have been answering this or you've been thinking about this uh, quite often. Stanford has a plan for opening up. UCSB has a plan for opening up. What's your take on what the universities are doing in terms of their plans for, for opening up? It's a long, you can have a long, short answer, but I just like to ask you this. <laughs> Probably the answer to that would, uh, would require uh, uh, about five days of, uh, of discussion. But, uh, the, the short answer is that uh, we just don't know exactly what is the best process to follow to reopen. Uh, I think everybody realizes that we cannot continue being online universities forever. We need to reopen. We need to try. Uh, we need to be very cautious. We need to be very careful. Um, I think it would be very nice for different universities to compare notes and uh, see whether they have some common features that they feel very strongly about adopting and whether there's ideas that uh, might be borrowed across uh, institutions. I would also argue that uh, we are academic institutions. I think it's, it's a great opportunity to design some uh, research studies about aspects of reopening an academic environment that we just don't know exactly which is the best way to go. I, I think, of course, these need to be vetted. They need to be approved ethically. Uh, we need to have informed consent who, for whoever is going to participate. Uh, but I think it's a great opportunity for academic institutions that do research and education to do exactly that in, in, in that situation because nobody knows which one is the best way to reopen, how fast, what to let go first, uh, uh, whether to use half the student population, uh, kind of alternating with the other half, uh, uh, what to do with dorms, uh, what to do with different facilities, what to do with different types of labs, uh, with different types of, of engagement and potential exposures. I, I, I think some answers are very clear cut, but many others are just uh, open to, uh, to scientific study. Thank you so much. We have gone over for by a few minutes. Thank you for participating and we hope to see you next week too. Thank you everyone. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.